Chapter 14 Matters Arising For various reasons, almost three weeks went by before Alan Hughes was free to come for a weekend visit, so that Zellaby's expressed intention of taking steps had to be postponed until then. By this time, the disinclination of the children, now beginning to acquire an implied capital C to distinguish them from other children, to be removed from the immediate neighbourhood had become a phenomenon generally recognised in the village. It was a nuisance, since it involved finding someone to look after the baby when its mother went to train, or elsewhere, but not regarded with any great seriousness, more, indeed, as a foible. Just another inconvenience, added to the inconveniences inevitable with babies anyway. Zellaby took a less casual view of it, but waited until the Sunday afternoon before putting the matter to his son-in-law. Reasonably certain, then, of a spell without interruption, he led Alan to deck chairs under the cedar tree on the lawn where they would not be overheard. Once they were seated, he came to the point with quite unusual directness. What I want to say, my boy, is this. I'd feel happier if you can get Farallon away from here, and the sooner, I think, the better. Alan looked at him with an expression of surprise, which became changed into a slight frown. I should have thought it fairly clear that there is nothing I want more than to have her with me. Well, of course it is, my dear fellow. One could not fail to realise that. But at the moment, I'm concerned with something more important than interfering with your private affairs. I'm not thinking of what either of you wants, or would like, so much as what needs to be done. For Farallin's sake, not for yours. She wants to come away. She set out to come once, Alan reminded him. I know, but she tried to take the baby with her. It brought her back, just as it brought her here before, and just, it appears, as it will if she tries again. Therefore, you must take her away without the baby. If you can persuade her to that, we can arrange to have it excellently looked after here. The indications are that if it is not actually with her, it will not, probably cannot, exert any influence stronger than that of natural affection. But according to Willers, Willers is making a loud blustering noise to prevent himself from being frightened. He's refusing to see what he doesn't want to see. I don't suppose it matters very much what casuistries he uses to comfort himself, as long as they don't take in the rest of us. You mean that this hysteria he talks about isn't the real reason for Farallon and the rest coming back here? Well, what is hysteria? A functional disorder of the nervous system. Naturally, there has been considerable strain upon the nervous systems of many of them, but the trouble with Willers is that he stops before he ought to begin. Instead of facing it and honestly inquiring why the reaction should take this particular form, he hides in a smokescreen of generalities about a long period of sustained anxiety and so on. Well, I, I don't blame the man. He's had enough for the time being. He's tired out and deserves a rest. But that doesn't mean we must let him obscure the facts, which is what he's trying to do. For instance, even if he has observed it, he has not admitted that none of this hysteria has ever been known to manifest itself without one of the babies being present. Is that so? Alan asked, surprised. Oh, without exception. This sense of compulsion occurs only in the vicinity of one of the babies. Separate the baby from the mother, or perhaps one should say remove the mother from the neighbourhood of any of the babies, and the compulsion at once begins to lessen and gradually dies away. It takes longer to fade in some than in others, but that is what happens. But I don't see... I mean, how is it done? I have no idea. There could, one supposes, be an element akin to hypnotism, perhaps, but whatever the mechanism, I am perfectly satisfied that it is exerted willfully and with purpose by the child. One would instance the case of Miss Lamb. When it was physically impossible for her to comply, the compulsion was promptly switched to Miss Latterly who had previously felt none of it, with the result that the baby had its way and got back here as did the rest. And since they got back, no one has managed to take one of them more than six miles from Midwich. Hysteria, says Willers. Hmm. One woman starts it, the rest subconsciously accept it, and so exhibit the same symptoms. But if the baby is parked with a neighbour here, the mother is able to go to train or anywhere else she wants to, without any hindrance. That, according to Willers, is simply because her subconscious hasn't led her to expect anything to happen when she is on her own. So it doesn't. But my point is this. Ferrolyn cannot take the baby. But if she makes up her mind to go and leave it here, there's nothing to stop her. Your job is to make up her mind for her. Alan considered. Sort of put out an ultimatum, make her choose between baby and me. That's a bit tough and uh, fundamental, isn't it? He suggested. 
My dear fellow, the baby's put the ultimatum already. What you have to do is to clarify the situation. The only possible compromise would be for you to surrender to the baby's challenge and come to live here too. Which I couldn't anyway. Very well then. Farallon has been dodging the issue for some weeks now, but sooner or later she must face it. Your job is first to make her recognize the hurdle, and then help her over it. Alan said slowly, It's quite a thing to ask, though, isn't it? Isn't the other quite a thing to ask of a man, when it isn't his baby? Hmm, Alan remarked. Zellaby went on, And it isn't her baby, either, or I'd not be talking quite like this. Farallon and the rest are the victims of an imposition. They have been cheated into an utterly false position. Some kind of elaborate confidence trick has made them into what the veterinary fellows call host mothers, a relationship more intimate than that of the foster mother, but similar in kind. This baby has absolutely nothing to do with either of you. Except that, by some process not yet explained, she was placed in a situation which forced her to nourish it. So far is it from belonging to either of you that it doesn't correspond to any known racial classification. Even Willers had to admit that. But if the type is unknown, the phenomenon is not. Our ancestors, who did not have Willers' blind faith in the articles of science, had a word for it. They called such beings changelings. None of this business would have seemed as strange to them as it does to us, because they had only to suffer religious dogmatism. Which was not so dogmatic as scientific dogmatism. The idea of the changeling, therefore, far from being novel, is both old and widely distributed, uh, that it is unlikely to have arisen, or to have persisted, without cause and occasional support. True, one has not encountered the idea of it taking place on such a scale as this, but quantity does not, in this case, affect the quality of the event. It simply confirms it. All these sixty-one golden-eyed children we have here are intruders. Changelings. They are cuckoo children. Now, the important thing about the cuckoo is not how the egg got into the nest, nor why that nest was chosen. The real matter for concern comes after it has been hatched. What, in fact, will it attempt to do next? And that, whatever it may be, will be motivated by its instinct for survival, an instinct characterized chiefly by utter ruthlessness. Alan pondered a little. You... Really think you've got a sound analogy there? He asked, uneasily. I'm perfectly certain of it, Zellaby asserted. The two of them fell silent for some time, Zellaby lying back in his chair with his hands behind his head, Alan staring unseeingly across the lawn. At length, All right, he said. I suppose most of us have been hoping that once the babies arrived, things would straighten out. I admit that it doesn't look like it now. But what are you expecting to happen? I'm just being expectant, non-specific, except that I don't think it will be anything pleasant, Zellaby replied. The cuckoo survives because it is tough and single-purposed. That is why I hope you will take Ferrelin away, and keep her away. Nothing satisfactory can come of this at best. Do your utmost to make her forget this changeling in order that she may have a normal life. It will be difficult at first, no doubt, but not so hard if she has a child that is really her own. Alan rubbed the furrows on his forehead. It is difficult, he said. In spite of the way it happened, she does have a maternal feeling for it. A, well, sort of physical affection and a sense of obligation, you know. But of course, that's how it works. That's why the poor hen works herself to death, feeding the greedy cuckoo chick. Well, it's a form of confidence trick, as I told you. The callous exploitation of a natural proclivity. The existence of such a proclivity is important to the continuation of a species. But, after all, in a civilized society, we cannot afford to give way to all natural urges, can we? In this case, Farallon must simply refuse to be blackmailed through her better instincts. If, said Alan slowly, if Angela's child had turned out to be one of them... What would you have done? I should have done what I'm advising you to do for Farallon. Taken her away. I should also have cut off our connection with Midwich by selling this house, fond as we both are of it. I may have to do that yet, even though she's not directly involved. It depends how the situation develops. One waits to see. The potentialities are unknown, but I don't care for the logical implications. 
Therefore, the sooner Ferelin is out of it, the happier I shall be. I don't propose to say anything about it to her myself. For one thing, it's a matter for you to settle between you. For another, there is the risk that by crystallizing a not very clear misgiving, I might do the wrong thing, make it appear as a challenge to be met, for instance. You have a positive alternative to offer. However, if it is difficult and you need something to tip the balance, Angela and I will back you up quite fully. Alan nodded slowly. I hope that won't be necessary. I don't think it will be. You both know, really, that we can't just go on like this. Now you've given me a push, we'll get it settled. They continued to sit, in silent contemplation. Alan was aware of some relief that his fragmentary feelings and suspicions had been collected for him into a form which warranted action. He was also considerably impressed that he could recall no previous conversation with his father-in-law in which Zellaby, spurning one tempting diversion after another, had held so stoutly to his course. Moreover, the speculations which could arise were interesting and numerous. He was on the point of raising one or two of them himself when he was checked by the sight of Angela crossing the lawn towards them. She sat down in the chair on the other side of her husband and demanded a cigarette. Zellaby gave her one and held out the match. He watched her take the first few puffs. Trouble? he inquired. I'm not quite sure. I just had Margaret Haxby on the telephone. She's gone. Zellaby lifted his eyebrows. You mean cleared out? Yes. She was speaking from London. Oh, said Zellaby, and lapsed into thought. Alan asked who Margaret Haxby was. Oh, I'm sorry. You probably don't know her. She was one of Mr. Crim's young ladies, or was. One of the brightest of them, I understand. Academically, Dr. Margaret Haxby, PhD, London. One of the, uh, uh afflicted, Alan inquired. Yes, and one of the most resentful, Angela said. Now she's made up her mind to beat it and gone, leaving Midwich holding the baby, literally. But where do you come in, my dear? Zellaby inquired. Oh, she just decided I was a reliable subject for official notification. She said she'd have rung Mr. Crim, but he's away today. She wanted to arrange about the baby. Where is it now? Where she was staying, in the older Mrs. Dory's cottage. She just walked out on it? That's it. Mrs. Dory doesn't know yet. I'll have to go and tell her. This could be awkward, Zellaby said. I can see a pretty panic starting up among the other women who've taken these girls in. They'll all be throwing them out overnight before they get left in the cart, too. Can't we stall? Give Crim time to get back and do something? After all, his girl's under village responsibility, not primarily, anyway. Besides, she might change her mind. Angela shook her head. Not this one, I think. She's not done it on the spur of the moment. She's been over it pretty carefully, in fact. Her line is, she never asked to come to Midwich. She was simply posted here. If they'd posted her to a yellow fever area, they'd be responsible for the consequences. Well, they posted her here, and through no fault of her own, she caught this instead. Now it's up to them to deal with it. Hmm, said Zellaby. One has a feeling that that parallelism is not going to be accepted in government circles and MCOM. However, anyway, that's her contention. She repudiates the child entirely. She says she is no more responsible for it than if it had been left on her doorstep, and there is, therefore, no reason why she should put up with, or be expected to put up with, the wrecking of her life or her work on account of it. With the upshot that it is now thrown on the parish, unless she intends to pay for it, of course. Naturally, I asked her about that. She said that the village and the Grange could fight out the responsibility between them. It certainly was not hers. She will refuse to pay anything, since payment might be legally construed as admission of liability. Nevertheless, Mrs. Dorry, or any other person of good character who cares to take the baby on, will receive a rate of two pounds a week, sent anonymously and irregularly. You're right, my dear. She has been thinking it out. This is going to need looking into. What is the effect if this repudiation is allowed to go unchallenged? I imagine legal responsibility for the child has to be established somewhere. How is that done? Get the relieving officer in and slap a court order on her, do you suppose? I don't know. But she's thought of something of the kind happening. If it does, she intends to fight it in court. She claims that medical evidence will establish that the child cannot possibly be hers. From this, it will be argued that as she was placed in loco parentis without her knowledge or consent, she cannot be held responsible. 
Failing this, it is still open to her to bring an action against the Ministry for negligence, resulting in her being placed in a position of jeopardy. Or it might be for conniving at assault, or possibly procuring. She isn't sure. I should think not, said Zellaby. It ought to be an interesting indictment to frame. Well, she didn't seem to think it was likely to come to that, Angela admitted. I imagine she's perfectly right there, agreed Zellaby. We have made our own efforts, but the unperceived official machinations to keep all this quiet must have been quite considerable. Even the evidence brought to dispute a court order would be manner to journalists of all nations. In fact, the issue of such an order would probably bring Dr. Haxby a considerable fortune, one way and another. Poor Mr. Krim, and poor Colonel Westcott. They're going to be worried, I'm afraid. I wonder just what their powers in the matter are. He lapsed into thought for some moments before he went on. My dear, I've just been talking to Alan about getting Ferrolin away. This seems to make it a little more urgent. Once it becomes generally known, others may decide to follow Margaret Haxby's example, don't you think? It may make up their minds for some of them, Angela agreed. In which case, and supposing an inconvenient number should take the same course, don't you think there is a possibility of some counter-move to stop more desertions? But, if, as you say... They don't want publicity. Oh, not by the authorities, my dear. No, I was wondering what would happen if it were to turn out that the children were as opposed to being deserted as they are to being removed. But you don't really think... Oh, I don't know. I'm simply doing my best to place myself in the situation of a young cuckoo. As such, I fancy I should resent anything that appeared likely to lessen attention to my comfort and well-being. Indeed, one does not even have to be a cuckoo to feel so. I just air the suggestion, you understand, but I do feel that it is worth making sure that Ferrolin is not trapped here if something of the sort should happen. Whether it does or not, she'll be better away, Angela agreed. You could start by suggesting two or three weeks away while we see what happens, she told Alan. Very well, Alan said. It does give me a handle to start with. Where is she? I left her on the veranda. The Zellabys watched him cross the lawn and disappear round a corner of the house. Gordon Zellaby lifted an eyebrow at his wife. Not very difficult, I think, Angela said. Naturally, she's longing to be with him. The obstacle is her sense of obligation. The conflict is doing her harm, wearing her out. How much affection does she really have for the baby? It's hard to say. There is so much social and traditional pressure on a woman in these things. One's self-defensive instinct is to conform to the approved pattern. Personal honesty takes time to assert itself, if it is ever allowed to. Not with Farrellin, surely. Zellaby looked hurt. Oh, it will with her, I'm sure. But she hasn't got there yet. It's a bit much to face, you know. She's had all the inconvenience and discomfort of bearing the baby, as much as if it were her own. And now, after all that, she has to readjust to the biological fact that it is not. That she is only what you call a host mother to it. That must take a lot of doing. She paused, looking thoughtfully across the lawn. I now say a little prayer of thanksgiving every night, she added. I don't know where it goes to, but I just want it to be known somewhere how grateful I am. Zellaby reached out and took her hand. After some minutes, he observed, I wonder if a sillier and more ignorant catechesis than Mother Nature was ever perpetrated. It is because nature is ruthless, hideous, and cruel beyond belief that it was necessary to invent civilization. One thinks of wild animals as savage, but the fiercest of them begins to look almost domesticated when one considers the viciousness required of a survivor in the sea. As for the insects, their lives are sustained only by intricate process of fantastic horror. There is no conception more fallacious than the sense of coziness implied by Mother Nature. Each species must strive to survive. And that it will do, by every means in its power, however foul. Unless the instinct to survive is weakened by conflict with another instinct. Angela seized the pause to put in with a touch of impatience. I've no doubt you're gradually working round to something, Gordon. Y yes, Zelby owned. I'm working round again to cuckoos. Cuckoos are very determined survivors, so determined that there is really only one thing to be done with them. Once one's nest is infested. I am, as you know, a humane man. I think I may even say a kindly man by disposition. 
You may, Gordon. As a further disadvantage, I am a civilized man. For these reasons, I shall not be able to bring myself to approve of what ought to be done, nor even when we perceive its advisability with the rest of us. So like the poor hen thrush, we shall feed and nurture the monster and betray our own species. Odd, don't you think? Uh, we could drown a litter of kittens that is no sort of a threat to us, but these creatures we shall carefully rear. Angela sat motionless for some moments. Then she turned her head and looked at him, long and steadily. You mean that? About what ought to be done? Don't you, Gordon? I do, my dear. It isn't like you, as I pointed out. But then... It is a situation I have never been in before. It has occurred to me that live and let live is a piece of patronage which can only be afforded by the consciously secure. I now find, when I feel, as I never expected to feel, my situation at the summit of creation to be threatened, that I don't like it a bit. But, Gordon, dear, surely this is all a little exaggerated. After all, a few unusual babies... Who can, at will, produce a neurotic condition in mature women, and don't forget Harriman, too, in order to enforce their wishes. It may wear off as they get older. One has heard sometimes of odd understanding, a kind of psychic sympathy, in isolated cases, perhaps, but in sixty-one interconnected cases. No, there's no tender sympathy with these, and they trail no clouds of glory, either. They are the most practical, sensible... Self-contained babies anyone ever saw. They are also quite the smuggest. And no wonder they can get anything they want. Just at present, they are still at a stage where they do not want very much, but later on, well, we shall see. Dr. Willers says, his wife began, but Zellaby cut her short impatiently. Willers rose to the occasion magnificently, so well that it's not surprising that he's addled himself into behaving like a damned ostrich now. His faith in hysteria has become practically pathological. I hope his holiday will do him good. But, Gordon, he does at least try to explain it. My dear, I am a patient man, but don't try me too far. Willis has never tried to explain any of it. He has accepted certain facts when they became inescapable. The rest he has attempted to explain away, which is quite different. But there must be an explanation, of course. Then what do you think it is? We shall have to wait until the children are old enough to give us some evidence. But you do have some ideas. Nothing very cheering, I'm afraid. But what? Zellaby shook his head. I'm not ready, he said again. But as you are a discreet woman, I will put a question to you. It is this. If you were wishful to challenge the supremacy of a society that was fairly stable and quite well weaponed, what would you do? Would you meet it on its own terms by launching a probably costly and certainly destructive assault? Or, if time were of no great importance, would you prefer to employ a version of a more subtle tactic? Would you, in fact, try somehow to introduce a fifth column, to attack it from within? Thank you for watching the video. Subscribe to hear more great stories.